Hello and welcome back if you saw my first video on exercise, music, and Parkinson's disease. If you didn't see the first video, welcome to you too. And I encourage you to watch part one as well. There's some background information there on exercise, music, and how they can impact Parkinson's that you may find helpful. My name is Jim and I have Parkinson's disease but I do not allow that fact to define me as a person. Welcome to our home. Come on in and we'll talk a little bit about how the music and exercise program is going. Maybe it'd be helpful to start by reviewing the improvements from the exercise and music program that I reported to you in my part one video. You may recall that I began to observe what I thought were some very positive results in a short period of time after starting the program. Stay with me and I'll tell you about another very positive and surprising development in just a few more minutes. In the part one video, I told you that in a short period of time after beginning my exercise and music program, my natural arm swing partially returned and that my posture is much more erect than before. This has continued to be the case. These two improvements have really been encouraging to me and have given me plenty of energy to keep the exercise and music program alive. My wife Jo and I have been exercising at our local rec center since July of this year. Now it's November. In the 18 weeks since we started, we worked out an average of four days a week. In my first video, I described for you the type of exercise that I do, primarily on the elliptical machine and the treadmill. Now that our Houston area temperatures are a little more reasonable, Joy and I take an occasional power walk also. Watch this and you'll get an idea of what this part of my life looks like these days. A couple of weeks ago I started noticing something quite significant for me. For probably the last five years or so I've experienced what's known as levodopa induced dyskinesia or LID. This happens to many people with Parkinson's who've been on the levodopa drug therapy for several years. It's a developed side effect of the levodopa. This is one definition of dyskinesia. Basically, these are motor movements that a person can't control. For most people who have this side effect of long-term levodopa use, the dyskinesias act up especially when one's dopamine concentration is highest in the brain, usually soon after taking the levodopa medication. Dyskinesias of this type are also aggravated by stress. In my case, stress of the most minor variety. An example would be engaging in a phone conversation of any type. My dyskinesias affect my right hand, my face, and especially my mouth. Sometimes the dyskinesias are actually more bothersome than the symptoms of the Parkinson's itself. Reluctantly, I'm going to show you just three examples of my dyskinesias. The following scenes give you an idea of what my dyskinesias look like. They're really minor in nature compared to what some people have to put up with. I'm still pretty self-conscious about this, however, and if we're going to be with other people for some event, I will minimize my levodopa intake prior to the event, whether it be a party, a dinner out, or whatever. I may not have good fine motor control, and I may drop a fork, but I'll take that over the dyskinesias when other people are around. I noticed a couple of weeks ago that my dyskinesias had gotten worse. I started wondering if I had too much levodopa in my system. I hadn't changed my daily dosage, so the hypothesis I pursued was that my exercise program had reduced my daily requirement of levodopa therapy. Others with Parkinson's have experienced this some weeks after beginning a regular exercise program. My doctor allows me to adjust the timing and dosage of the levodopa based on my symptoms and my response to the levodopa. After observing that my dyskinesias had worsened, I slowly reduced my daily dosage of levodopa by 40 percent. 
This simple slide gives you a feel for what 40% reduction looks like. It's a lot. Since making this medication reduction, my on time, which is the sum of the time periods during the day when the levodopa is effective in assisting my fine motor movements, has been very high and the dyskinesias have been reduced. Even though occurrences like this have been widely reported in the literature, the fact that this has happened to me definitely inspires me to keep up the program. I'll continue to keep you informed of all results of my exercise and music program by way of future videos. I have a new motto for my program. I hope you like it. If you have PD, you're welcome to adopt this slogan if you would like to. PD is our enemy number one. Until the researchers find a cure or a means of putting PD in prison where it can't do more damage, we're fighting this PD enemy with exercise and music and a positive attitude. I mentioned in the part one video that when I finish a complete workout at the rec center, I am really whipped. Occasionally, I have to give myself a strong pep talk to finish my workout. I feel good about it when I do even if it is temporarily tiring. I can relate to both of these guys who are really tired and very thirsty. Sometimes I even daydream about aliens from another planet coming here and destroying all the EFX machines in the whole world. It's believed by researchers in Parkinson's disease that exercise can improve brain functioning, especially memory and executive function, which gets into things like planning, decision making, and multitasking. Parkinson's patients have also reported they've been able to reduce significantly their daily dosage of levodopa, as I told you that I have, after implementing a vigorous and sustained exercise program. This could be partially due to the fact that dopamine production in the brain is increased when a person exercises. Animal studies have shown that cognitive improvement is significantly greater when the little mouse is forced to exercise vigorously using equipment the mouse doesn't particularly like or control. For example, the mouse kind of enjoys running on his little wheel, but he does not like running on a mouse treadmill the speed of which is controlled by the technician, not the mouse. However, the unhappy mouse on the treadmill will demonstrate more improvement in brain functioning compared to the mouse who simply ran on his little fun wheel. A human comparison might be someone running 10 miles on a treadmill versus riding a bicycle through the neighborhood for 30 minutes. Most experts conclude that participating in an exercise program for six months will result in a measurable improvement in cognitive function, even for significantly impaired patients. The more strenuous the exercise, the larger improvement you'll see in the way your brain works. Oh, you have to keep up the exercise program. If not, you lose your gains. There have been numerous studies on humans using actual Parkinson's patients. I'll tell you about one interesting informal study conducted by Dr. J. Alberts a Parkinson researcher. I read this story about Dr. Alberts in this wonderful book, Brainstorms, The Race to Unlock the Mysteries of Parkinson's Disease by John Pofferman, also a person with Parkinson's who was only diagnosed in 2011. I heard about his book from another person with Parkinson's and his wife, neither of whom have I ever met in person. It's really a small world we live in today. Mr. Pofferman researched the material for his book largely by visiting medical and neurological experts around the world, as well as a number of exceptional people with Parkinson's disease. Dr. Alberts is an accomplished cyclist and a native Iowan. He participated in several week-long bicycle rides across Iowa on a tandem bike with a person with Parkinson's on the rear seat which is known as the stoker in bicycle parlance. Each year, Alberts observed a striking phenomenon. The stoker's Parkinson's symptoms virtually disappeared. This was true even for one stoker who had undergone deep brain stimulation, or DBS, 
who voluntarily turned off his stimulator during the event. Other exercise studies that Alberts had read about had not shown such a dramatic change as this. Alberts wondered, what's, what's different in my experiment? It finally came to Alberts. The stoker wasn't doing voluntary exercise. The stoker was doing forced exercise, just like the disgruntled mouse. Albert's companion's normal pace might have been, say, 60 RPM. But with Albert's in the front seat, the stoker with Parkinson's disease was forced to cycle at about 90 RPM. It was Albert's conclusion that the forced exercise caused a near miraculous reduction in each of his companion's Parkinson's symptoms. In reviewing the program I defined in Part 1, the two items I haven't worked on yet, are the last two. I will be in the near future though and I'll let you know how it's going. As to the second item, I've experimented with a metronome app on my phone while exercising. The metronome has a distinct clear sound on each beat and the tempo is accurate and constant. It is used widely for gait training in music therapy clinics. I've been alternating between the metronome and music every 15 minutes. The neurologic music therapist, whom I consult from time to time, has suggested that I use the metronome to warm up for exercises and get my mind and body locked into the rhythm and then use the music with my exercises exclusively. She also stressed that the music must have a strong rhythmic component and the same tempo as the functional cadence for a specific form of exercise. I'll be back to you with a part three video soon, I hope. But before I go, I'd like to change the subject slightly and leave you with some positive thoughts. I was reminded of something very recently, not specifically connected to music or exercise, but it's so important for our well-being physically and mentally that I wanted to share just a few of these thoughts with you. So here we go. Surround yourself with positive people, thoughts, and things. This is so important. I had a few negative thoughts one morning a few weeks ago about something that happened the previous afternoon that was totally my fault. I apologized to the person afterwards who happened to be my wife, Joy, but the occurrence was still on my mind the next morning. I just wouldn't totally let it go. When I went through my morning workout at the gym, my balance wasn't good, my gait wasn't the same, and my energy level was very low. I know that the negative thoughts in my head that morning had a strong effect on my state of mind and body. I finally put it away about 24 hours later. My main problem was continuing to carry around the guilt instead of forgiving myself and getting on with life. So don't you let negative thoughts take up residence in your mind. Be positive. Associate with positive people whose company you enjoy. If someone continually makes you unhappy, you need to clear that relationship out of your life. Read positive books. Apologize, forgive yourself, and move on. Go to movies that are uplifting or humorous and make you feel good. And if you're a person of faith, Practice your faith. Strengthen your faith. Avoid getting wrapped up in negative news stories and commentaries. Keep the conversation positive. Listen to music that you enjoy. All of these things will reduce stress in your life, which is good for anyone, but especially someone who has Parkinson's disease. These are just some things I found valuable in my life. I'm happy when morning comes and I can start another day. I seldom ever have a morning like I told you about. I can't wait to see my wife. She sleeps a little later than I do, and I love visiting with our friends and family. I believe I'm the most fortunate man in the world, and I hope these thoughts may be helpful to you. I heard someone the other day say, I have Parkinson's disease, but Parkinson's does not have me. So remember that. And thanks for listening. And remember...